Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will talk about merger and acquisition. I know that this topic looks uh, a lot of um, more financial, if I can say, or something that is really for professional of the finance. But here we'll include a bit of the regulatory aspect. And I have with me Eric Volbrecht from Axon Lawyer, who will help us to have better understanding because Eric is also working on this kind of, of topics. And I think it's really an important topic because Uh, there is a lot of merger and acquisition that are happening, uh, even on small companies. And uh, we will we want to, if I can say, explain to you uh, that it's not only financial. There is also a lot of regulatory aspect and Eric will help us for that. So, Eric, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thanks very much, uh, Wally. We're happy to be here again. So, um, what do you think? Oh. So, um When this topic, so I, th I think during last podcast that we had, we talked a bit about the fact that you were doing this uh, this kind of activity. So, is it mm -hmm. is it an activity that you are doing a, a lot actually, actually or not? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm uh, working on some nice uh, big ones right now, but they are very secret, so I can't. Uh, so you have yeah. to tickle me to uh, to know uh, about them. But yeah, I would say that any given moment, I am working on uh, on, on two or three uh, big mergers uh, or acquisitions in uh, in devices. Yeah. So um, and uh, maybe let's let's educate a bit uh, the people that are listening now to understand what exactly is a merger and acquisition. Uh, is it only a merger? Is it only an acquisition? Or is it both a merger and acquisition? So how can we explain easily, if I can say, what it is, what is a merger and acquisition? Well, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, mergers and acquisitions is basically, uh, let's say, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a general uh, name for several ways to uh, uh, acquire a company. A merger is when uh, one legal entity uh, literally like merges with another legal entity, like they, they disappear into each other uh, like, and then there's only one left. Like they can also do a reverse merger, like where like a maybe one uh, separates from the other. Uh, and then there's the acquisition where uh, you really sort of, you get, you acquire another company, which doesn't happen by amalgamation, for example, as it's called, but rather um, rather you acquire, for example, all the assets of another uh, company, like you acquire all their all their. Uh, their production facilities and their stock and their brands and things like that. But in the end, merger and acquisitions, functionally, it means the same one company buying another. But it may also be, for example, an investment company acquiring a controlling interest in a medical devices company. That's, that's usually called an investment, but legally it is also an, uh, uh, an acquisition of uh, shares. So an okay. acquisition of voting rights, if you will. Okay, so uh, as, as we say, so mainly when we talk about a merger and acquisition, it's, it's a lot of financial activities, uh, financial mm -hmm. discussion, how we can grow, how we can make the business better. We have to acquire yeah. this company for that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, I think, I mean, the regulatory aspect is really something that Uh, maybe, I don't know, you'll tell us, uh, a lot of companies are forgetting. They are looking specifically or focusing on the financial aspect, but and they, they, they put the regulatory aspect, the product regulatory, the legislation aspect um, in the background. Is it correct? That is uh, totally correct, yes. It's, uh, in that sense, it's, uh, it's often they don't begin with the end in mind or they prioritize other things. It's a bit like what you see under the MDR with economic operators, uh, where the supply chain is always structured now for tax and customs and logistics optimization. And then you start talking to them like, uh, hey, guys, uh, you know, there's also these MDR supply chain regulations. And they're like, huh? <laughs> and it's, it's the same with mergers and acquisitions, basically. I mean... Often, uh, often the, uh, the, the, because there's always like this whole army of lawyers, consultants, investment bankers, everybody and their mother that wants to earn a buck uh, jumps on that train, uh, especially if it's big. And of course, everybody has their own little game. And usually they find uh, tax, uh, tax and corporate more important. And then they forget all about the uh, the regulation that makes the business possible in the first place. 
But I, th I, th I think they are, they are maybe thinking, oh, we can solve that later. It's not like a problem, um, it's just something that we can solve later. True, yeah, that's that. Well, if, if they think that far ahead, actually, usually they just think like, uh, oh, usually they think like, oh, acquiring a uh, medical devices company uh, is, just acquire, is, is just like acquiring any old widget company. So any company just making stuff. And then they, they tend to forget that, well, actually medical devices are pretty heavily regulated uh, things. So for example, you need to think about, okay, uh, if I, uh, the, the way I structure my, uh, my transaction, what kind of consequences will that have uh, in the regulatory space? And is there anything that I need to do in advance? Because like you say, they, they, in the best of cases, they think that, oh, we can always fix something afterwards. But especially now with the MDR uh, being and the IVDR later on uh, being in the, uh, uh, in the grace period or going to the grace period where you're dealing with legacy devices, if you are acquiring a company these days uh, that has legacy devices planned, then you need to do, know a lot about whether the way you acquire the company will result in significant changes, for example. And that is something that in all of the transactions I've done in the last year, or maybe the last two years, nobody has basically planned for that. Maybe one single person in the regulatory department that says, maybe we should look at this. And they're, then they're always like, oh yeah, shut up. Okay. <laughs> But nobody, uh, want, nobody wants to listen to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, as I said, I, as I said, we, we are really looking at the figures and say, oh, we'll make this amount of millions and whatever, etc. Uh, but yeah, if we arrive to this period of the of the UMGR, uh, we can forget all those figures because yeah, uh, as we said, we have this transition and we can do cannot do anything during the transition. Otherwise, we'll have to uh, transfer to the new regulation. But uh, how? Yeah, how does if, if, if I may interrupt you, that happens especially a lot when you have a big company or a big investment fund acquiring a startup company. Because then they think like, oh, the startup company, yeah, it doesn't cost very much, maybe 10 million euros, maybe 15 million euros, maybe 50 million euros if you're lucky, which is still total, total small change in uh, mergers and acquisition. So then they don't really pay attention to processes like that because it costs money to do this. Right, yeah. but then they but then they tend to forget that if you don't do this right, then you end up paying for a company more than once because first you pay, then the you pay additionally too much, which is basically paying a second time, yeah, and then you pay a third time because you have to do all this remediation afterwards. So you exactly. basically pay for a company three times where you can pay for a company once. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And um, I was part of some merger and acquisition and uh, mainly uh, the remediation process is something that is a nightmare for us, a regulatory people, exactly. because uh, we have to hire a ton of consultants coming and making all the changes of documentation, uh, trying to, to, to solve all the issues. And yeah, as you say, it's a third, the third payment, as you mentioned. Exactly. But and by that time, the investment bankers are all uh, driving around in their new Porsches, uh, having closed their Excel sheets. And they're yeah. like, uh, <laughs> why is this company not performing as it's supposed to be? Well, because you didn't listen to the regulatory people, you idiots. That's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly. why. But how do you think? So um, we have a process where we have to investigate on the company before, mm -hmm. which is called due diligence. So yep. how do you think we can execute this due diligence correctly and then spot the issues before they happen or spot the issues and know about them so that we can, if I can say, buy the company at the right price instead of buying mm -hmm. too, ex too much, if I can say, with a higher price and then paying a third time for the compliance or remediation. So what, how, how would you do uh, this kind of due diligence for that? Well, if I do it myself, then I always, uh, always at the moment, I always, first thing I ask, because uh, I mean, I'm a European lawyer, so I do the part of the due diligence for Europe. And I will always, first thing I look for is what kind of certificates, okay. CE certificates does the company have, right? Are they legacy device certificates? Uh, do they have a legacy device strategy? 
or do they already have NDR, NDR certificates? Well, if they do, then that's very rare, but it does happen. Okay. Most, com most companies have a blend, so they are in transition. And the second thing I do is look, does the data room, yeah, so basically the, uh, basically the, the, the electronic uh, these days um, environment in which you uh, allow somebody to investigate your company, does it contain a clear NDR transition plan? If both of these things are negative, then I start to wonder, ah, okay. And what I also do, third part, that's also very important, is I always look at the management presentation because whenever there's there's a sale of a uh, of a company, then uh, the seller will produce, or the sellers, investment bankers will produce this fantastic, usually around 80 to 70, 80 pages of uh, PDF document that, uh, that, that is a really, really glowing review of everything that this company can achieve in the next five, six, seven years. Okay. And then I look in that document and then I look like, uh, then I first look, do they have an NDR transition strategy that they describe in the document? If not, and I know about uh, whether they have legacy devices or not, then I look whether any of the promises that they are making in the document, like for example, you can completely go in this direction with the company, or the company is about to launch this new functionality of the product. And then I know like, okay, well, especially with software companies, that's always a thing, right? So they have this platform and then they say, yeah, in the next few years, we will add these functionalities. Okay. Well, then you know, like, uh oh, if this is a legacy device, how about significant changes for additional functionality? And it's it's man, it's mainly the, the this point that that is really important is to say that uh, during a merger and acquisition, we are trying to make, if I can say, the the company at at its best, if I can say, view to exactly. say it's it's a beautiful company. It has a lot of potential. We can do this. We have that on the pipe for R and D. We can have this functionality, etc. But this yeah. is the part where we can say, hey, alert! This is a danger because. This yeah. is true, it's fine, they have that, but they don't include any regulatory aspect of it. And then this can put in danger the acquirer, if I can say, the, 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 the company yeah, yeah. that's acquiring the company because they have no clue of this regulation or these changes. I suppose it's, like, it's, it's, basic, it's basically like like going going buying uh, buying a uh, buying a secondhand car of of somebody you don't know on a parking spot next to the highway and not looking under the hood and saying oh ah you look like somebody trustworthy can I pay you in cash <laughs> and not test drive your car yeah of course you can people will only be happy to sell your car on that basis. But it's, and that's it's, actually how they do it with these companies. It's 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 just mind-boggling. But it's it's important also to say that if you are already a medical device company acquiring another medical device company, you should already know all this. It's not like it's not like a surprise for you. You should know that there is this transition because you have also to do it for your company. So if there is a mm -hmm. merger where we have both companies that makes one that have maybe two different, it's a medical device company, so two different types of products, but they want mm -hmm. to merge to make one company with a, a big portfolio. This, normally, they should know about that. Yes, but that's, that's uh, I think, uh, normally between quotation marks is a very important word here because normally, indeed, the knowledge is in-house, but it is not operationalized for the purpose of that acquisition. Why? Because the regulatory people in the acquiring company are usually way too busy with MDR stuff anyway. And also, uh, management of the acquiring company has set its sight on the prey. They want the other company. And then the whole, then basically this really weird uh, process of corporate confirmation bias will, uh, will kick in, where once they've done an initial calculation, it doesn't almost doesn't matter what kind of uh, burning skeletons fall out of closets and explode in their face. They will buy the company anyhow. Okay. Also, because and that's that's also a problem. I think what you see with a lot of uh, the bigger medical devices companies is that they're not that innovative anymore. So they have to buy innovations in order to keep their own pipeline going. 
And then they are even, uh, they get to the weird point where they are less interested in buying a company that actually has valid CE marks than buying people and technology because then they will integrate that in their own product lines will take longer, but they will do it that way. And then they're perfectly happy to accept that, uh, that, this, that this is the consequence. That might be a strategy, by the way. Eh? You might say, okay, we are going to buy this company and invalidate all CE marks in the process, but we are doing this consciously. Fine, that can be a strategy and then reapply it. But that's almost, if you ask management in those cases, is this your intention? And they will look at you like, uh, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then you have to explain the whole thing to them again. But, yeah. but it's, I think it's important what you are saying here is the fact that you can buy a product, but you cannot buy a CE marking. You yeah. have to reapply everything. So you can buy a product and say, I will increase my portfolio with this kind of product, but it's your portfolio. So it's your certificate. So it's your CE marking. It's your notified body. Yep. Everything is yours. So you cannot just say, oh, this product is already CE marked. Then when I will acquire it, I have nothing to do. You have everything to do from the zero. Yeah, and that's, that's a really good point because that's one of the biggest misunderstandings in, uh, in M&A around uh, companies with uh, CE marks in devices, but also in other areas where there are CE marks, is you cannot buy a CE mark. You can only buy a legal entity in who that, that, base, that has a CE certificate in its name And if you don't change anything in the transaction, then the CE certification stays in place, but you cannot buy a CE mark as such. So also often you hear people or uh, even sometimes notified bodies and regulators talk about transferring a CE mark. It's not possible. You cannot transfer a CE mark. The only thing you can do is you can do a sort of like for like issuing as they would call it, that where you will, uh, cancel one certificate and you issue a new one with the exact same scope that maybe even refers to the old certificate number. Yeah, that's for, for example, what BSI did when they, uh, when they uh, moved all of, their, uh, all of their manufacturers from BSI UK to the Dutch uh, notified body, everybody got new certificates. It's not like these certificates were transferred, they were reissued. And that is legally speaking or regulatory wise speaking, that is a really important thing because if you structure a transaction and you bu don't buy the shares in the legal manufacturer, but rather you buy the plant and you buy some people and you buy a lot of stock and you buy some patents and some, uh, some trademarks, then you cannot assume that you buy the CE mark as well. Because then after the, uh, then the, uh, then, Yeah, you need to get uh, the le new legal manufacturer because you don't buy the legal entity needs to obtain a new CE mark. Now, these days with notified bodies having scarce time, that takes time. So if you're going to structure a transaction like that, you need to talk to a notified body in advance and say, hey guys, if, uh, if, if the legal entity uh, is going to change to a new legal manufacturer, but the The factory stays in the same place, the whole quality system stays the same, same people, same procedures, blah, 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 blah. Will you please issue me a new CE certificate in the name of this new legal entity? And will you please do it quickly? But if you first do the transaction and then say to the notified body, oh, by the way, can you fix this tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> they can't. So or, I th they, I think or they will ask you a lot of critical questions that you've never thought about, and then you don't have the answer. And then the notified body is like, okay, bye-bye, back, back to the bottom of the pile you go, talk to us in half a year. And, and, this is, and they can do that. The notified body can say, uh, I mean, they are here to certify your products and to guarantee mm -hmm. that what you have placed on the market is conform and everything. If they see that there is an irregularity, if there is an issue, if you are changing things without informing them, if you are thinking that it's just like a document to change and whatever, they can stop certifying you and then you, your business is over for a certain time. Yeah, they, they, they just revoke the certificate or, or even in a, in a situation where let's say you buy everything, you buy all the assets, but not the legal manufacturer entity. Then you start producing and then uh, somebody will say, hey, 
are you the legal manufacturer? And then the old entity will say, no, man, I sold the company to those guys. And then they go to those guys. Who is the legal manufacturer? Oh yeah, we, we bought the company. Yeah, but you never got a CE mark uh, for a legal manufacturer for the company in a new situation. So illegal. So um, do you think, I mean, uh, maybe in terms of, of a team of uh, lawyers, as you said, there is a, a full trend where people will jump in <laughs> like uh, financial people, lawyers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, do, you, do you see or mainly, uh, because I, I think there was maybe a lot of merger and acquisition happening. So do you see always kind of uh, lawyers that are really specialized in healthcare in those kind of uh, transactions? Uh, well, normally there are. Uh, of course, I see myself in those transactions, and there are there are quite a number of others also that are more or less specialized in this. But what you see is that uh, it's a bit like uh, uh, you feel sometimes feel a bit like uh, uh, Don Quixote, the, uh, the, the 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 Spanish uh, hero uh, fighting uh, windmills. Okay. Because because they throw you in in a transaction and they say, oh yeah, by the way, uh, uh, this this whole transaction is ready. Here's the share purchase agreement. Please do a, and you have one day and here's data room access. Please do a red flag uh, review. And with things like that, I usually say, are you sure? Because what will you do if I find a red flag? I mean, of course I will look in the direction of what you're doing, but I mean, is it going to make any difference what I do? Because if I find a critical flaw, then you're going to do the transaction anyhow. Yeah, 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 that's true. Okay. Anyway, I'll take your money. I do the review. <laughs> and and then, then, then you do the review and you say, oh, yeah, we need to change the share purchase agreement or the asset purchase agreement like this and this and this. Or did somebody talk to the notified body already or whatever? They're like, yeah, no, it's not possible. So it's, like, it's, okay. it's, it's also something that, um, if I can say, um, companies, if I can say, will discover maybe afterwards. So do you have some cases where they call you afterwards and say, can you help me fix all this? Oh, yeah. It's usually when they are in a big conflict with the notified body and then they call them all kinds of nasty names and say that uh, the not <laughs> and they, they say the notified body is not cooperating. And then <laughs> you look at what's happening and then you see a notified body saying, in still very polite terms usually. Hello, who are you? We don't have a certification agreement with you. Why should we do anything for you? Oh, you want a certification agreement? Well, then please sign on the dotted line and maybe you can join in the back of the queue. And then everybody is surprised that that's happening because nobody thought to check beforehand, can we get this pro project to run smoothly? Right, that's, 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 that happens all the time. But Or what also happens is that, for example, um, they uh, uh, if you have a complex transaction with like a hundred legal entities or something, it might be that some legal manufacturer fell off the wagon uh, somewhere, uh, certificate got invalidated, uh, somebody gets uh, gets into an incident, and then an, a, a competent authority starts looking into this and finds out that hey. There is no legal manufacturer anymore for this. And then you get sometimes get these weird sort of mini pip kind of situations where, yeah, the, 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 the perpetrator uh, is, is dead and buried and nobody has done it. Basically, what are you going to do then? Or you get into to the situations where uh, that also happens where, um, a, uh, a regulatory department is completely understaffed to do all the work that is necessary to implement the, uh, the integration of the company in the new structure. And somebody forgets that a significant change takes place there, uh, which is at the moment, well, you can still get into a nasty discussion with the notified body that says, hey, This is a substantial change. You should have notified us about it. We will suspend the certificate while you fix this. Right? This is this is bad, but it's not, let's say, lethal. Yeah. But what we will get after the date of application, which is, by the way, next month. Yeah, 50 days. <laughs> I said that on the last podcast. So 50 days, five yeah. zero. So <laughs> move forward. I mean, imagine that that we're in a in in a in in a in a time that you can say uh, date of application of the MDR is next month. But anyway, 
So then, then you see these that uh, when the uh, when the date of application has passed. I mean, we are still not sure what will happen when a significant change is affected, and the notified body finds out. Because I know that at some point there was this team and B sort of bullet point guidance that said how they were going to work with significant changes, which basically said, if we find out that there's a significant change that you have not told us about in advance, your certificate is immediately revoked. Well, that's kind of, yeah, that's high stakes poker, uh, you could say. And now it's still not clear what member states instruct the notified bodies to do, right? Because in yep. the end, as we've also seen with the remote audits, not every member state instructs their notified body the same way. German notified bodies are not allowed to do remote audits. Dutch notified bodies are allowed to do uh, remote audits, for example, for the MDR. So same, we can get into the same issues with the significant change issue that some notified bodies may say, one strike, you're out, gone is your certificate, bye-bye. And others may say, oh, 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 it looks like a significant change. How about we issue a major non-conformity for that that you have to fix very quickly? But we, we actually don't know what the policy is going to be there. So it means that yes. there is there is a lot of unknown also of this of, for, for this kind of thing. So we'll see yeah. after the tough application and see how it is working. But uh, mainly uh, everything can happen. And um, what what we thought is that because of the MDR, which is medical device regulation and not directive, mm -hmm. uh, there will be more harmonization. But apparently, yeah, this is not helping a lot for that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, somewhat, but uh, as long as you have member states that can still totally disagree about stuff, I mean, how, how stupid is it that, that member states are still disagreeing about, uh, about things like these remote audits? I mean, either everybody says no remote audits or everybody says, yeah, let's do these remote audits. But like this, I mean, it is Europe at its... At its, at its weakest, I would say, it's really like, so what do you want? I mean, it's, yeah, on the one hand, it, 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 well, and I think it also shows how much the member states still run the show yeah. under the MDR. Because when the MDR came out, a lot of people were thinking like, oh, yeah, the MDR, now it will be the commission that does things. Yeah, it's so funny. Exactly. If you look at, for example, especially Americans, they will always say, the commission has to do this. The commission has to do that. The commission can't do shit. They can only say, well, guidance is coming. Guidance is coming. Oh, NDCG, will you please hurry up? And, and compared to the directives, yes, the commission has some additional powers. But still, I mean, whenever the commission wants to do something really interesting, They need to do it by means of an implementing act, which is comatology, which means that always the member states can block it. So, uh, so if, if, if we are talking then of a merge and acquisition, if you do that in mm -hmm. one country or another, oh. you can have different also uh, results. It's uh, something that can, that can yeah, be... For example, yeah. Yeah, you can have, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with different notified bodies in one transaction even, I mean, there are companies, I've been in, uh, in, in uh, transactions where I had like five notified bodies for one company and then every notified body responds differently. Well, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> and, that's and still, and, and notified bodies themselves, they will say, look, we, we would like to help you with this stuff. But you have to tell us in advance. You have to tell us what the idea is, how you're going to do it, how you are, how the transaction is going to affect the quality system or not affect the quality system. So we can quickly decide, okay, this is how we're going to do this. But it needs three parties to cooperate. And what you often see in these M&A transactions is that um, these days, especially for the somewhat smaller companies, it is usually an auction. So literally an auction, it's like who, which, which of the buyers, uh, whichever of the buyers uh, uh, of, yeah, basically ponies of the most money will get the company. And under these circumstances, it's really difficult to go through a controlled process with a notified body to explain what the situation after the transaction will look like. Now for that, there's also things you can do, which in my view are also always neglected, is that you, um, is that you uh, negotiate as a buyer 
or as a seller, if you want to send off your, uh, your company in a good way, negotiate good transitional services or transitional provisions. Like, for example, because there's always the, the, the situation, there's the, the moment that the deal is closed, yeah. Yeah, when the agreements are signed, and then there is the moment of closing of the transaction, which means that everything that has been done to close the transaction has been done. There's usually a couple of months in between. So what you can also do there is think really hard and good, preferably in advance about what does this transaction need in order for it to complete in a controlled fashion, uh, to have the notified body ducks in a row, but also to make sure, for example, that the company has enough regular no regulatory knowledge and uh, a sufficiently staffed regulatory department to be able to function on a standalone basis, which is often a problem if a company is taken out of a bigger group of uh, companies and uh, starts to work as a standalone company, for example. So these are, these are always things that you need to think about. And in my uh, experience, these are, yeah, almost never well considered. And especially in auction deals, it's also a, a sport that not only the buyer that offers the most money will buy the, get to buy the company, but also the company that is the least difficult about the share purchase agreement or the asset purchase agreement. So basically, the more insecurity you are willing to accept as a buyer, the higher the chances that you get this company. Okay. Now, if we, if we go back, yeah, if we take that given and then we go back that medical devices companies should in the air, they should, of course, they should be in service of the shareholders. Of course, that's how it works. But they should also be in service of patients. And if you have this kind of uh, seat belts off, pedal to the metal, let's see if we make it and uh, drive this thing into the wall and see if it survives kind of <laughs> way of, uh, I mean, that doesn't help patients, I can tell you. I mean, it just risks actually innovations not, uh, yeah, not in the end becoming what they can be. And I think that's, that's, that's a pity. Yeah. This could be done in a much more rational and controlled way, if you ask me. No, I think it's, it's, it's important here. So um, please involve a, a, a specialized lawyer in healthcare, I think like Eric, for this kind of, of exercise. Because, yeah, yeah, and, and, and involve a specialized one because uh, you can also involve a not specialized one, but that usually creates more problems than it solves because they will look at the wrong things or they will make a big fuss about the wrong things. So really make sure that you get somebody who knows what they're doing. That's not only me, there's lot of, lots of others as well. But, and, and also listen to them. That's also quite good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's important because during the due diligence, it's where you are finding all the issues and trying really to find a solution or strategy, how to solve them. So if you have those kind of issues or you, those kind of hints and you are not taking them into account, maybe uh, you will pay that later, as you've said, with a, a third wave of, of payment, uh, which is maybe not what your shareholders are really trying to, to look for. So uh, yeah, involve specialized people, but listen to them also. And I have been part of some um, merger and acquisition. And as I've said, a lot of time, as you mentioned, they want to buy the company, whatever we can say to them, but they are, if I can say, thinking, oh, let's solve the issues afterwards. Let's first buy the company and then we can talk about the issues, which can be a strategy, but it can be a really a costly one. So, uh, so you have mm -hmm. really to, uh, to think about, about that. Um, Eric, so I think, yeah, thank you for, for this. I think we have really covered a lot of things regarding, regarding merger and acquisition and people can already also co contact directly Eric if there is any, any question about that. Um, so Eric, you, you have, um, uh, we talked about that, if I can say on a few podcasts, but uh, you have your book that will be coming uh, in yeah. May. So uh, just a pre-announcement because it's not available now, but it will be coming in May. Uh, so um, who should buy this book? Who should buy it? Well, everybody, of course. Uh, <laughs> now, but I mean, <clears throat> yeah, the book is going to be, it's, it's, it's an annotated version of the MDR and the IVDR. So if you're working with the MDR and the IVDR, both as a lawyer and as, a, uh, uh, as an RA or quality person, uh, it'll be interesting because what I've tried to do is to, uh, just like you would have in these nice uh, German uh, commentaries to annotate 
almost every provision of the uh, NDR and the IVDR, and also uh, put in an introductory chapter that describes basically how does, how does it work on a higher level. And then I've also put in some tables in the back that I've worked with, like for example, overlaps between the MDR and the IVDR, which are really convenient for the IVDR people because they can see at what, on what clauses the MDR is identical or highly similar. So you can see which wheels have already been invented under the MDR, even if there's nothing specific for IVDs. And um, yeah, there, there, it's going to be uh, available electronically only because it was too much hassle to, uh, to get it uh, printed. Also, because it's, it's a lot of pages. I think it'll be about 1,500 pages. I don't know yet because really on the 1st of April was actually the last day that I worked on the manuscript and then handed it in to the, uh, to the layout people. So it's going to be available on 15 May. That's the planning now, but uh, I'll, I'll make sure that this is uh, known with uh, marketing. And uh, yeah, I hope it'll be interesting for people. I mean, basically it's like a sort of core dump for, of what of my knowledge, but uh, well, you never know, of course, whether that is interesting enough for other people. Maybe other people know more, who knows? Yeah, let's let's maybe make a, another episode. Maybe I, I will just uh, I will buy it and uh, look at it, and maybe we can select a certain section of it and discuss about that on a podcast episode also. Because I think uh, what is interesting is mainly uh, interpretation of the EUMDR. Because yeah, each time you have something to read and you say, how should I interpret that? So having uh, some guidance on this kind of thing can be really helpful, and I'm sure it will be helping a lot of people about uh, how they should execute some of the articles of the EUMDR and IVDR. We'll have have more and more IVDR episodes. So I have an IVDR episode that will be also coming uh, soon. So um, I'm sure, yeah, this will be also helping those IVDR companies to be uh, to be on, uh, uh, yeah, safely on the market because Definitely. IVDR is in 2022, but it's really close. Also, it's one year, and there is a lot of things to do. So people really should should be ready for that. One year is less time than it uh, takes to write a book. I've been writing this for four years, I think. So, uh, so, so you see. <laughs> Great. My so wife thank was you. like, what are you going to do now, dude? You need a new hobby because your book is finished. It was so funny. But uh, I think I think there is uh, there is still a lot of things. I mean, we, we also said the fact that uh, even if your book is finished, there will be some version two already planned because there will be some MDCG guidance that will be issued, some oh, yeah. more implementing act, etc. So it will be something that will be also evolving. So I suppose and it's we, not, uh, we, but, not and we will have the uh, the carnage of the uh, of all the differences of opinion about what happens at the date of application, right? I mean, there's there, there's there's still people that are fighting over whether Article 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 of the MDR apply to legacy products, for yeah. example. I, I had this question this morning on my emails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's something that is that is important to say that uh, yeah even even after date of application we still have a lot of, to discuss and a lot of interpretation to to see and or also an, another interesting question that I had recently if you have a, uh, a a a CE certificate for a product that is uh, uh, that is not allowed for NDR CE under Article One Six let's say H or something. Right, because it's like a, a viable, a viable yep. bacteria or something like that. Does that mean that at the date of application, your certificate, which has a date on it until 2024, is the certificate valid then or invalid on the date of application? There's competent authorities that say, yes, invalid. But if you look in the law, I think, well, there's, there's very good grounds to argue it's not. These are all problems that will be solved uh, in the next uh, six months. So you can be pretty sure that the next edition of the book will cover all these uh, all these uh, situations. Great. Right. So impatient. This, this one is actually covered in the book already, except that I disagree with the competent authority. But okay. What do they know, right? <laughs> no problem. Let's discuss about that maybe another podcast then. Okay. So Eric, I really thank you for that. Thank you for your help on this. So don't hesitate also, uh, people don't hesitate to go, to go on the show notes. I will place uh, some links there. 
there. Uh, and if you have any question, you can uh, send us uh, a message on, on, the, on the YouTube channel so there will be some comments. Or you can also uh, connect directly with uh, Eric on LinkedIn and uh, yeah, ask or, you or, questions. Or maybe, maybe in your Telegram uh, group. I'm in a Telegram group too. If they just uh, reference me with an ad in the uh, Telegram uh, group, I can also answer it there. Yeah, I will put the Telegram group also on the on the show notes so that people can can go there and uh, and link. And if you have any question, there is a chat che- section where you can ask your question, and we can really uh, try to answer to that uh, anytime. So no, no problem. Okay, so Eric, really thank you for that. Thank you for your help, and I wish you a nice day. Very welcome, and likewise. Bye-bye.